loving and gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather now at the time of sacrifice on a holy convocation, we, we, we give you our hearts as best as we can. We're really not good at giving you everything, but we purpose today to mm. spend this time thinking of you and your goodness and, and your love for us, and, and we ask that your spirit will be with us now as we share and um, talk about people's testimonies to your glory in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. We both just have something very little to share and then we've asked Val to share her testimony. Oh, yay. Yeah. She has a good story. I heard all about it the last time and we almost missed the turn off to Rainbow Bay because we were so close oh. talking to each other. Um, last Passover, which was our first camp here, um, I found it very oh, yeah, busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm very busy now too, but just looking after Daniel and things that we have to do with him after the evening meeting, like fellowship in the evenings, and, and then we have a few things we have to do with him before bed. And So I was getting to bed about midnight every night, and he was waking up really super early, and so I wasn't getting very, very much sleep. And I was complaining to the Lord about that. <laughs> <laughs> and saying, you know... Laying your burdens on him. Yes, but I was, I was um, gently rebuked. <laughs> and... It's only now, a year later, now that we've studied much more into the character of God, that I can understand the character of that rebuke. Because, and it's the only time I really ever remember kind of hearing like an audible voice in my head. Um, there was one other time, before I continue with that story, there was one other time way back when my boys were very little. Adrian was very sick, year 2000, 2001, and we had some issues going on and at that time I seriously was starting to think I might become a single mum because he was that sick and um, I was finding it really, really hard. I went into a bedroom and I think I shared this last camp, last month, so, um, that I knocked down and I just said, oh, that's too hard. And, and he, I felt a brief arm around my shoulder, just for a brief second and and the message was, but I don't think it was an audible voice, it was just sort of an impression was that I'm not going to take away the burden, but I'll walk with you through the burden, through the pathway. So, and anyway, back to last Passover. My gentle rebuke was more an audible voice, and it was, now that I understand more of the character of God, I can see the quality of what he said, and the way he said it. Like you could say, slap, slap, slap. No, come on, pick yourself up. You've got lots of things to be thankful for. Stop whinging. <laughs> but he didn't. He just said to me, you speak of lack, but my children don't lack any good thing. And that's all I heard. And it was like, and, but the, the gentleness and the kindness and the, the quality of that rebuke, I can understand now that I understand how loving our father is. And it was just really... And it was now coming back again, and I'm still tired, and I'm <laughs> still busy. But it rings in my ears, you speak of lack. And it's just the quality of that voice confirms how loving and how gentle he is with us. And what Marco said, you know, the Lord could have kind of said to, to Marco many things to arrest his attention, but he's gently just going, um, have a look at this, Marco. I do exist. <laughs> and, you know, it takes time for you to process. Mm. And he's gentle and patient with us. Mm. So, mm. that's my little testimony. I think he's got something <coughs> to say to me. Just recently, I have been rereading Wagoner's Glad Tidings, probably for about the fourth time. And every time I read it, I understand a little bit more. <laughs> um, and there were just, there's just two little things. Um, both, I think, um, have some significance when we're thinking about the character of God. <coughs> quite, they're quite different. Okay, quite different little things that I gleaned from it. Um, the first one is from Genesis 5.16. Because he's, because he's um, talking about Abraham and the promise to Abraham. Um, Genesis 5.16, if you want to look it up. And remember that he's been he's been talking to Abraham about uh, uh, 
So he's, he's, he's talking to Abraham about the promise of the land. And then they, they do that, uh, walking through the, the pieces of meat and stuff. And I think this is towards the end of it. And it says, in the fourth generation, they will come hither again. So he's talking about the descendants that will know that they won't, they won't get the land until the fourth generation. They'll come back again. For the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. That's the bit that I'm interested in. Which verse is this? Genesis 15, 16. Oh, sorry, I've misled you terribly. So, think about this. The God who is not willing for any to be lost and who loves us with a long-suffering love wooed the tribe, the, the native people of the land of Canaan for 400 years. If they had heard his voice, and I'm sure that some did, when the Israelites got to the promised land, the native people would have become Israelites by adoption. They would have just been melded into the Israelite people. Sadly, not many of them did, but we know one really famous person who did become an Israelite, and that was Rahab. Rahab. Yes, so that was, that was one little thing. Um, so, I'm just going back to... No, no. In the last, in the last chapter of Galatians, Paul's talking about um, bearing one another's burdens. And he also says, bear, bear your own burden. And he takes us to 1 Peter, get this one, 1 Peter 5, 7, which says, cast your cares upon him, and he will care for you. So I was pondering that idea of casting cares, and it came to my mind a picture of a fisherman casting his net. Um, so he's got one hand holding the rope and with the other hand he's got the net and he flings it out and it becomes a beautiful circle and lands in the water and then hopefully he's got some fish in it and he brings it back in. But that in a way is quite a ludicrous picture really when we're thinking of, of casting cares on Christ because how, how able are we to fling our cares onto Christ? Well, the thing is that even if we try to fling them off us, they're going to come back. As the net comes back, our cares come back. So, so Wagner explains this beautifully. This is, this is something that really touched my heart. Um, so, here, let me just get my thoughts together. My nervousness, my mind is going very quick. I should have made one. Um, okay, so that picture of the of throwing your throwing our, our cares onto Jesus kind of implies that Jesus is way out there somewhere, but he's not. Where where is Jesus? He's actually in us through the Holy Spirit, isn't he? Yeah. Um, and there's that beautiful verse in Galatians 2.20, which Debbie might be able to tell us. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. 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 It is no longer I that live, but Christ, Christ, Christ lives in me. So Wagner brings out this thought that if we, when we have Christ in us, and we are at the point where we can say, I am, I am nothing. I have nothing to offer. My thoughts are not your thoughts. 
and as self is crucified, as the, that body of sin diminishes and Christ becomes more in our lives, our cares and worries and our burdens slowly rest on Jesus' shoulders. And he knows exactly how to deal with them. So, the last bell now to come and to get me away from the pollution in the city. The pollution in the city is nothing like it is now. <laughs> <laughs> so Dad got a, car, a little caravan and, and he had a truck. Now I must tell you, my husband, my, my, my um, father was blind, mm -hmm. but he, well, he wasn't completely blind, but he was very low vision. So Mum had to drive up the front with him and take the wheel every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> There weren't very many cars on the road in those days. No, there wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> One day we went up a hill, I don't know where we were, because I was only young, and um, the, ca the back of the caravan, or the wheels of the caravan around it, went over the side of the bit of a cliff, and it took us a while to get it back onto the road again. And we got down the bottom of the hill, wow. and my father looked at the back of the truck and saw that it was or something needed something done to it anyway. So he said he was going into town. He left mum with us in the caravan with the children, with, you know, with my brothers and sisters. And um, and I didn't know at the time because I was too young. And you don't notice when you're young, but mum was pregnant. And so we did some washing. We hung it up amongst the trees. And, and then um, she went inside to have a rest and we played outside. But when it got dark, we thought, we better go inside and see, you know, see what's happened, see where Mum is. But anyway, we went in there and she was, she was moaning, and I thought, oh, I wonder what's wrong with Mum. Anyway, she started taking oh, fits. She had toxemia, <coughs> and she put these fits on the floor. And we we got under the little table. They used to have a little table that you flattened down to make a bed, but it was up. So we all hid under the table while she was fitting, and then she. Uh, stood up and she said she couldn't see. So she felt her way around the caravan. She fell out the door and hit her head on the garbage can on the bottom of the door, cut her head, had all dirt over her face. Then she went looking for Dad and screaming out for him, where are you, where are you? And she got wrapped up in the washing. Anyway, by this time I thought she was going mad. And she, and she had another bit of yam at the clothesline. And I didn't know, I really didn't know what to do. And then I heard a car come in and I thought, oh, and it was pitch black, there was no moon, no moon. Oh, wow. So I went up onto the road and very bravely <laughs> stood in the middle of the road. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> and this man and woman stopped. And the man could hear my mother screaming, you know, for her father, for our father. And um, he went down to see what, you know, to see what was wrong with her. And next minute he comes back, just about carrying her back to the car. And the woman stayed with us in the caravan and gave us dinner and all that sort of stuff. And put us to bed, we went to sleep. Yeah. Next morning I woke up and Dad was there and they were gone. She, she was the woman was gone. So um, uh, I said to Dad, I told Dad what had happened. And he said he, he said he knew because some people got in contact with the police to, and they found him at the hotel. Oh, oh, yeah. he, he wasn't going to come home at, you know, in the night with his low vision. So um, 
so I don't know how he got home. Maybe somebody else drove home mm -hmm. with the other people. I don't know. Oh, no. But anyway, um, she had a little boy, mm -hmm. but she was blind, and we didn't know for a while. Mm -hmm. So I had a blind father and a blind mother, and this little tiny baby, and they put him in one of those uh, humidity cribs. It was a really tiny little thing. Anyway, she stayed there for a few days and then they put, put her in the ambulance and they brought her to Sydney because this was down at Golden. Mm -hmm. And they took her to, Bruce, no, to, to Sydney and she was in hospital for quite a long time. And so was my little brother, of course, until he got a bit of weight and size on him. Mm -hmm. And he got pneumonia and mm -hmm. he got very sick there for a while and I thought he was going to die. But, but he survived and got going again. And while she was away for those well, about four months, um, we were put into a Salvation Army car, which was good. I enjoyed it, yeah. Four kids my own age. <laughs> and the other ones were put in the little kitty bit, and I used to go and visit them every now and then. Yeah. So anyway, we came out of that, and that, that was that. Anyway, we had a Catholic upbringing because my mother was Catholic, and my father was Church of England. No. And in the eyes of the church, this was not a recognised marriage, you know. So the priest used to come along and annoy mum when dad was away and um, say that these little children of yours are all going to hell and you'll be going to hell. And she used to get very upset with a lot of things they said. And I didn't like that at all. But anyway, wow. she eventually... Pardon? Did she recover herself? Yes, they sent her home after about four months. Just a couple of days before we came home. No, she got her sight back, which is good. Um, anyway, so the priest stopped coming around after a while because after a while we we caught on to the fact we're going to be rude and we're going to pretend we're not home and keep on the land. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I found some friends and I, we had our bikes and off we went riding around the place and it came to, to this big bushy area. It would have been about four or five k's from home, mind you. But anyway, we went down there and we found this army dump on the other. It was big boxes with, with jeeps in them, all left over from the war because I forgot to mention I was born 42, 42 um, years after Federation. <laughs> I told my husband that one day. I said, you know how old we are, we're ancient. <laughs> so um, anyway, we went in this, we were at this army dump and I had the big camouflage net which we put up around the trees. There was papers and there was an old radio. <laughs> we ringing around, we had helmets on. <laughs> and then we found these funny looking things. We didn't know what to do with them. We thought they might have been lights. And we tried hanging them up from the netting. And they had little rings on them. <laughs> and I said, we couldn't pull it out. We couldn't, we couldn't sort of pull it out. <laughs> So we thought, oh, I'll take it home to Dad. <laughs> so I took it home. So I took it home with my bicycle, it's bouncing around and the I took it home and my father, I just said to my father, can you get this out? <laughs> and he, had, he, he couldn't see what it was, but he felt it. And he thought, oh. And he said, where'd you get this from? <laughs> and I told him. And he went and saw Mum. He said, "This is what it, what it feels like." And she said, ah, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, oh. <laughs> so he disappeared up to the police station. I think I don't know. He disappeared with it. And we went back there a couple of days later to see, have another game there. You know, run around madly. They had guns and all that. No ammunition, luckily. I wish we might have been shooting each other. But anyway, um, that was gone. All the stuff was gone. So I think he missed the police station and made the move that during those couple of days. <laughs> so we were very protective. Someone was looking after us all this time. But there's a picture of an angel holding the pen in. And we didn't have all bitumen roads and it was bumping yes. up. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I used to help my father up the backyard and because he didn't have his side, he couldn't get a regular job. And he knew we had a an old draft horse, her name was Dolly, and he had a cart. And on Mondays he used to go and collect rags 
and then on Tuesday he'd go and get metals, and then on, you know, every day of the week had something. We had bottles and all sorts of things. So we had all this stuff around the yard, and I had to help Dad sort it all out. And, um, oh, that, that, that was just helping Dad. <laughs> but, um, even with the rags, we used to, uh, if there were the zippers in, in clothing, we used to take, take, cut them out, mm -hmm. and we'd unstitch them all. And, yeah. and we would put them in the little bags and sell them to shops. Yeah. So it wasn't long after the war, mm -hmm. they appreciate things like that. Yeah. And buttons, and we sort them all out to the same size and collars and things. Uh, took us, we were always working, doing something. <coughs> anyway, um, that went on for years and years and years until I got a little bit bigger, I think. You know, and the other, the other children used to help us out at the school. And then we had a bit of time to run around and do usual few things. <laughs> um, anyway, I came home from school one day. We went to the Catholic school, of course. Um, and I, I used to come straight into the into the kitchen and put my bag down and help Mum get tea. You know, and this one day she was doing some beans. And I took over from her. Oh, and I started yeah. telling her about my school day. And all of a sudden she said, Oh, will you shut up? And she'd never ever spoken like that to us before. You know, it really freed me. And I ran out the back and I started crying and I wouldn't come back inside. And she was saying, Oh, please come back inside. Anyway, I went back in and then she told me that she was pregnant again. But this would have been with her sixth child. So, um, uh, she said to me, she said, oh, she said, tomorrow I'm going to the hospital in the, in the middle of Sydney. And she said, I really don't feel like going by myself. Would you come with me? And I said, of course I will, you know. Great to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> so off we went the next day. We sent the other ones off to school. And we went to uh, the railway station. We got a train and then we had to get a bus. And um, so we got this bus and she... When she got off the bus, she said, oh, she said, I'll have to sit down. So we sat down at the bus stop, and when she felt better, we thought we'd better go across the road because the hospital was right across the road, which was good. Anyway, we're halfway. The, the lights turned green, no, green for the walkers to go <coughs> So we started walking across, and halfway across, she collapsed in the middle of the road. And, one, and some women walked past, and they said, fancy being drunk at this time of day and all this sort of thing. No one helped us. And then the lights changed, and all the traffic is going down. <gasps> And, uh, and then the lights, the, the traffic stopped again with the lights. And then, um, mm. <laughs> oh, that's right. The, the, all these other people came and they wouldn't help either. Oh. And then all of a sudden there was two nurses running, trying to catch up with the, with the crowd to get across in time. And one, and they came past us and they said, oh, what's wrong, what's wrong? You know, I told them, I said, mum's collapsed or she's fainted or something. And they, so one of the nurses oh. stayed with me because by this time the traffic lights had changed and, and the other uh, nurse went off and got orderly from the, from the hospital. And they came out and picked her up that time. We went to the hospital and then they took her away and luckily I picked up her handbag. Um, so I had money to get home again. Mm. And they said, and I wanted to go and see it before I left. And they said, no, you can't see it. But they said, you better get your father to ring us up as soon as he gets home. So off I went mm home. -hmm. Can you hear me up the back? <coughs> yes, that's good. <laughs> um, I, when I got home, I told that the hospital wanted him to ring. So we went down. There was only one phone box about three streets away. So we walked down there. Mm -hmm. And then we... I got a number for him and he had to talk on the phone. And I sat outside so I didn't hear what the conversation was about. Um, and then, well, it would have been about two days later, uh, he said, oh, Mum's had an operation and she's not feeling very well, but we'll go and see her tomorrow. So we went to see her the next day and she was quite happy and recovering a bit. Then we, we saw her for a couple of hours and then we all left and we could wave to her. When we were down the bus stop, we could we face her window where she was and she was giving us waves and throwing kisses and that and she was allowed to come home in another two or three days. So we went home, we cleaned up the house and did everything that we should do. <laughs> and the day she was due to come home we went to school and we came home in the afternoon and uh, looking for mum, you know, but mum wasn't there. But dad was there and he took us into the lounge room and told 
and told us that she had died that morning. Oh. So, um, so that was that. Mm -hmm. And then we, um, oh, after the funeral, uh, oh, a couple of days after the funeral, we went back to school again. And, oh, that's right, one of the, nurses, one of the nuns from the school came and said, your mother's in heaven now. Oh, I didn't know the word hypocrite, but this is what I was thinking. You hypocrites. I said, how would you know where she was? <laughs> what pathetic words, eh? <laughs> Not knowing what I'd be thinking now. Uh, <laughs> and she was very shocked, you know, because, and I felt a bit sorry for her afterwards because I thought she was trying to be nice and then I, you know, ripped this into her. <laughs> uh, so that was mum. Oh, when Mum died, I just turned 14. I was about 14 one week old. Was it that you said toxemia? Toxemia. Was that what she died from? Well, she had bad kidneys as well. Mm. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I, I thought I was being very brave, but really I must have been in shock. Yeah. Because it wasn't until Christmas that it struck me what had happened to her. Mm. Because it, because usually at Christmas time we I used to help Mum with a lot with cooking, and she wasn't there to get you know to do the chickens and lollies and do this and make cakes and things and all that sort of stuff you did. And that's when I broke down and I became real pot case. And they were going to put me into hospital. I was already pretty thin. I was about 40 kilos, and I think I went down to about 30 over the next month. It's just wow. skin and bone was like a yeah. And my sister said to me, oh, that's right, my father went up to the hotel one day and he came back, this one was still sick, and he came back with a box <coughs> of oranges. And my sister said, why don't you have, a, have an orange? And I said, I don't feel like anything at all. I was only living on about two arrowroot biscuits a day and oh. a cup of tea, that's about all I wanted. I was just so full, I not bring up anything else. It was awful. Anyway, she said to me, she said, look, Dad's just getting over the death of Mum, and he doesn't want you to know it. She said, why don't you try some orange juice then? So she gave me that quarter glass of orange juice. And I, and I thought, oh, I better drink it, because I didn't want my father to be hurt anymore. So I drank the orange juice, and I went to sleep, and I woke up, and I started to feel hungry. <laughs> and that was, so the next day, she gave me half a glass of orange juice, and we built up. And I eventually ate four boxes of oranges. <laughs> and I was back, blue, red, red, big pink cheeks. And the asthma disappeared. And I think that was my first introduction to natural food. <laughs> and you love oranges. <laughs> I love orange juice. <laughs> um, but um, then we went back to school again and Dad Put the, the two the two boys into the state school because it was closer to home and he didn't like the Catholic Church convent where we were going anyway. So they went there and I used to call in from school on the way home to pick them up. One day I went there and the boys weren't there, but their, their suitcases, their, their bags were there and their jackets and their hat and everything they had. And I said to one of the teachers, where, where are my brothers? And she said, Two men came in a black car and took them up to Coggridge and Mara's brothers' house. So I picked everything up and yes, and I raced home and waited for Dad to get home because he was working at the tip as a, as a gatekeeper at that stage at the tip. And so you, whatever you got in your car, you put that there and you put it there. And if he liked it, or if he knew what it was, he put it there. <laughs> we had lots of things at home. <laughs> And, uh, oh, he was ropeable when I told him and he went up to the police station and they drove up to the school. And this, by this time, he, the, the, the you know, school was finished and they were the only two at school. And that was about five k's away. And they didn't know where they were at their age. You know, the young one was six and a half. No, he was seven. He was be seven. And the other one was eight. And they didn't know where they were. They are just sitting there in the... In the playground wondering what to do and the police drove them back home. And then it was only about, oh, probably about three weeks after that, that there was a knock on the door and it was, um, they said they were welfare people. We still to this day, well I, I, I wasn't quite sure if they were, but 
they said they were. Um, and that because our father was blind, we were going to be fostered out to different people. So anyway, <laughs> Dad, I went outside with my dad and I said, Dad, there's some people at the door and they want to make us away. And he said, who? I said, I don't know. They said they're from the welfare. So he went out there to see them. And he fought, to, well, he said a few words to them and he wouldn't let us go or anything. So they took him to court. And and we found out that the Catholic Church had gone on to them as well, so that they could be fostered, so that we could all be fostered into a Catholic family. Oh. So I didn't like the Catholics. <laughs> but anyway, I know, at that time, at that time, yeah. I, when I was at school once, one of them hit one of the boys over the head, oh, over the ears, and he fell backwards down the stairs and broke his leg, and then she went down there and told him not to put it on and grab him up the stairs. Oh. Oh, really? Oh, you know, no, really? You know, people. Anyway, um, he was allowed to keep us all at home with the proviso that he got another woman in to look after us. Well, we had a, we had a stepsister from my father's well, her, her mother had died, and this is why we had this stepsister. She was a bit older than us, so, but she was married, and she came in and looked after us. And when it all cooled down, she left, and I was old enough then to look after her. So that was that. Is there five, five of you all together? Are there five children? Um, no, there was only four by that stage because yeah, one had died, and mum died with one as well. So that was two that died. Otherwise, it would have been six children. Yeah. Um, anyway, I I left. I eventually left school because I really got fed up with what was going on. And I was home for a fortnight before I fostered enough courage to tell Dad that I hadn't been to school. <laughs> and he said, "Well, that's okay. I did the same thing when I was young." <laughs> so I felt okay. <laughs> Then I began working at the taxation department. Um, but I was only there for about a year and a half and I and working and being sort of a working mum as well, you know, it was a pretty big job. And looking after dad. Because I'd iron his shirts and then my brother would take his shirt and that's not in it for you. <laughs> um, I got a, I broke out this great big rash. I didn't even notice this rash. I know I was, my hair, I was getting bald with patches in my hair at all. And I used to cover it over. <laughs> and, um, here we up to the nerves breakdown. Yes. I went to the doctor and he said, he said, those welts you put on you are not chicken pox because that's what the boss thought it might have been. He said, you're heading for a nervous breakdown, you'll have to leave home. Mm -hmm. So, it took me a long time to get up enough courage to, to leave home. I couldn't tell Dad I was leaving because I knew it would break his heart and I wouldn't leave. So um, I, I got the boy across the road. He had a youth. He took me away. I left it to make it hurt because <laughs> I couldn't face him. Um, so I did that. I worked at the taxation department for a while. And then I worked on the railway as a cook on the railway on the Melbourne Express. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a really good job because that way I was back in town, or like in Sydney, and, and away every second day, and they gave me a bit of a break. So that was a really good job. Then I went to the private maid, and then I became a telephonist, and I was there when the, you know, when the big, aircra the big aircraft, um, what was they called, aircraft carriers, mm. had a collision with the boiler and all that. I was on that and I was doing that. Mm. Mm. So I was on that. Anyway, then I met my future husband, and then he proposed, of course. <laughs> but then he said something to me one night, and I thought, mm, I don't like that in people. <laughs> so I had second thoughts about marrying him. But three, about three days before our, about three nights before our wedding, I was asleep in bed, and. You know how you feel as if someone's watching me? Mm. And, and I opened my eyes and I saw this, because we lived near Sydney Airport, and they used to have the searchlights going around. You know, the old searchlights used to go around mm. the airport. And they used to shine through them in the whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> anyway, I 
I felt as if I was being watched and I opened my eyes and I saw this whispery thing coming in. And that was, it was the same shape as my mother. And it came in and it lit across the, across the floor and stood beside my bed. And my sister was in the bed, this, well, we're on the other side of the room, we had a shared room. And I tried to, and um, I thought, oh, I'm going to put my finger through this because I didn't believe in ghosts. And I started to sit up to poke my finger through the thing and I got halfway up. I was half sitting up, halfway down, and it paralysed me. And I couldn't shout out to my sister in the other bed. So I was just there. And that talked to me in a telepathic sort of way. And, you, and, and it had answers for things that I know now that it knew <laughs> because it had been watching me now. But um, at that time I didn't know that and I really thought it was my mother. And, she, and it said, oh, look, marry this man, he'll be, he'll be a good husband and all this and I'll be watching over you and all this sort of stuff, you know, and I believed it. So off I go and I go and get married after all. But then he turned out to be a hard man to live, very hard man to live with for many, many years until he had an accident. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we got married and we went, went up to, he, he lived up outside of Gyra and, we, and his, his father had died on the 6th of August. My father died on the 6th of August as well, but only about 40 years later. Wow. What a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we went up to the um, to this property and the government, we couldn't get any, any handout or anything. No, like there's no dollar or anything there, but they used to have a hardship thing, but they wouldn't give it to us because we had property. So we lived off this property for about three years. We lived on kangaroo, all the unclean stuff, kangaroo and rabbit, wild duck. <laughs> uh, there was trout there because in the, in the creek. And uh, blackberries, quinces, <laughs> and we were, we were really healthy. And for our first Christmas, we bought half a pound of sausages. <laughs> oh, our pun brain, our sausages. <laughs> so we had sausages for Christmas, and I made a Christmas pudding out of bread, crumbs, grain, rocks, and a lot of sugar. <laughs> anyway, we made a bit of money. Because we used to kill rabbits. We, we, we used to go rabbiting in the night time. We, we started about 8 o'clock at night and we'd finish probably about half past two and then we'd spend the rest of the night until dawn. Uh, what you call gutting them and carrying them off and all that sort of stuff. Yes, we did that. Um, then we used to sell them. But it was so cold in that area where we lived. We, could, we had a, a fridge laying on the side and we used to open the, open the door up and put all the rabbits in there. And they wouldn't even go off. We had no cockroaches there. <laughs> we had no mosquitoes. It was good. We had a lot of flies. <laughs> but outside the flies, that's all we had. It was really cold. Um, anyway, eventually my husband um, started. Oh, he started shearing. He found a shearing contact uh, contractor, and he started shearing. He used to go away for six weeks at a time, and I was left alone. And, I'd go around our property, it was one and a half, it was a little bit over one and a half thousand acres. Yeah. And I'd walk, it was about a 10k walk around the property, checking checking the fence and checking the, you know, checking some sheep we had, we had there. And, um, and then after three years of marriage, no, well, not be four years of marriage, anyway. No, I was 25, and I got married when I was 21, that's, yeah, what's that? Four years, four years, yeah. We had our first child. The following year we had our second child and we used to take these two children, they were both in nappies <coughs> and we would, um, we went potato picking, yeah. then we went pea picking, they used to be absolutely black by the time they get married. <laughs> Dribbling and gobbling young babies and stuff, <laughs> black by the end of the day. And so that, that was that. And the place where we lived had the bedrooms up one end and a big veranda and then they had the kitchen and the bathroom down the bottom. So we, um, overnight time, we, we used to go to the kitchen, we lived in the kitchen, and then this one particular night my husband went to bed and I was darning his socks, that's what I was doing, being a very good woman, darning his socks by the fire, so 
and um, um, well, that's right. I went and turned the generator off outside, and then I came. I didn't have any shoes on. I should have had shoes on. And I walked up the veranda. And I just got to the door to open the next part of the house where the bedrooms were, and I trod on a black snake. Oh. Well, I didn't know it was a black snake at the time. And I didn't know which end I trod on because I was oh. black as anything. But I knew I must have must have trodden very near his head because the tail was going like this, not biting me. I thought, I must be on his head. So I yelled out to my husband, and he eventually woke up. I don't know how long I stood there. <laughs> <laughs> and he came out, and um, he had to go and get some matches, and he said, I'll oh, cut his head off. And I said, OK, then we'll just do something and hurry up. <laughs> and this thing's flashing around. So he went and got a knife and he came out and he's got matches. He said, you hold the match. <laughs> so, oh, oh he cut his head off. Well, he had to get the blunters. <laughs> he's trying to cut it off. <laughs> and then he's trying to bash it. And I said, look, you'll cut my foot in a minute. <laughs> so, so he did that. <laughs> but he did eventually kill it. And the next morning when it was light and we could see how big it was, it was fair. I think it was about five foot long. Oh. Anyway, one night I was, one of the kids was feeding and I got out and looked out them during the night. And there was the big comet in the sky, Bennett. It's called the Bennett Comet. And it was a really lovely comet, but better than Hailey's, I reckon. It was really good. And while I was sitting there thinking, I wonder why God made comets. This is where I first started thinking. I wonder where, why God made comets to go across the sky and bash into the land, you know. Anyway, I started thinking of God making the world. I thought, I wonder how he made the world. And I started thinking of him as if he was in a spaceship. <laughs> and he's going, going around. I thought, where would he get all the material to make a world from? And I thought, oh, this is a bit stupid. So I put that thought away. Eventually, my husband got a job as a station hand over on another copy, so we went over there. Um, and while we were over there, the, the manager's wife said to me, um, there's, there's other station hand down next to you. She said, don't go down there. She said, the woman down there is a bit queer. She said, she doesn't eat meat. <laughs> and she said, she's a bit, she doesn't talk to us much. <laughs> And she said, oh, she said, I don't like her. And she said, I advise you not to have anything to do with her. So I didn't have anything to do with her for about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see her anyway. But um, we went away one long weekend and we came back and, the, and of course it had to start raining. Mm -hmm. And we got a flat tire and we could see our house over there. <laughs> so my husband changed the tire, but by the time he took Change the tire, the water was up to your wife for us to go through it. So we sat there with these two happy children. <laughs> because they were about four and five then. And um, then we had to wait for the water to go down again. And then when we got home, the wood was all wet and we couldn't start the fire and we couldn't start, start the, you know, get the stove going again or anything. Then there was a knock on the door and here's this young fellow that also worked there as a station hand. He had a great big big um, boiler full of vegetables, hot yeah. steaming vegetables. Oh, could have given a big, big kiss. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he said, Mum sent these up for you. She saw you sitting on the other side of the creek and thought she'd make some extra oh, food for you. But he said, there's no meat in it because we don't need meat. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. And we got stuck into the veggies. Yeah. And then we all went to bed. The next day, I, I took her container back down to us. And she said that, um, she started talking about religion, and she said <coughs> that she came to the Lord, she had had a heart attack, and she said to the Lord that if he got her through this, then she would, she would follow him. And this is what she did. Wow. So she did that, and, um, and she said, do you read to your children? And I said, yes, I read them every night. She said, she said, I've got some Arthur Maxwell books here. She said, would you like to read some of these to them? And I said, oh, yes, I'll do that. So she gave me the first one. And I thought, and when, I'm, when I got it home, I thought, I think I'd better read this to myself before I read it to the kids. Mm -hmm. So I read it and I got as far as the videos. <laughs> and it had all about the unclean food and the clean food. Oh, no wonder they reckon they're mad. <laughs> 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 so I took it back the next day and I said, look, 
Uh, I can't agree with this. And so we gave the book back and thanked her very much for it. And it wasn't long after that that the property was um, sold. Um, the manager manager <coughs> told me that um, it was left in the will. Of this or the, this person who owned the property had left it in the will to the Salvation Army, and the uh, and the Salvation Army. Now this fellow had died, wanted to sell it, so we had to all move. And I, I didn't find out where she went to for some years. And we, and we went back to our little, to our property, which was next door to the other property we had been living on. And we lived there um, in this little shed that we built. It was only two rooms. And we didn't, I didn't even have a kitchen in it. There was a place for the stove, but we ended up doing shearing in there, and the kitchen was a shearing thing. We had all these bales of wool in the lounge. And we'd, live in, and we'd sleep in this little pokey cart wherever we could. So that was pretty good. Um, and while we were in the shack, in that shack there, we had, we had uh, rat problems. And my husband said, well, we'll have to get rid of these rats. So we put a rabbit trap up on the D part there, right above our bed. And one night, <laughs> I heard this squealing, and I sat up in bed to see what it was, and I got hit in the face <laughs> with a rat. <laughs> <laughs> and it was swinging. Up to this part, yes. Anyway, we sold the property. We sold it to, to some um, English people who had come over and they had won the lottery and they bought our property. <laughs> And I took my little kangaroo I had, I had a little joey that I brought up. And they, but they left it outside one day when it started to rain. And it got in the rain, it just got dead after about three hours. So they're very, very... Um, yeah. Anyway, we, so we sold that and we went to Ballina. When we got to Ballina, our third, our third son was born. Um, and while I was in hospital, oh, that's right, it was, there, there was Cyclone David approaching the coast. I had to go in and have a baby just when that was about to come. <laughs> and uh, when I came out of hospital, somebody had been around to see, to see Neville and had given him a little Gideon Bible and had talked to him about the Sabbath. And he said, and he, when I came back, you know, I was waiting there one day for, for the, because the water in the Caribbean Park was up above just above the walls, it was just hitting the bottom of the caravan, we thought we were going to float away. But anyway, it went down, when it went down, everybody made a big dive for the laundry. <coughs> and I was waiting to go into the laundry as well. And Neville grabs me by the arm, he said, why do people go to church on Sunday? He said, it says in, in the Bible that they should be going to church on Saturday, you know, on Saturday. And I said, I don't know, go and ask someone, <laughs> someone who goes to church on Sunday. And anyway, he, he didn't. He took me over to the calendar and he said, "Look at the calendar. This is day one. This is day two. This is day one. all this." Right. Anyway, I went. Off, I went off to the laundry then and left him with it. You know, I said, "Look, go and, go and have a look. Go and have a talk to somebody else." And I left him with it. Um, so after after the cyclone David had all finished and all the flood had gone down, we went out to Tully to the sugar, uh, sugar cane, and he worked, my husband worked on the sugar cane, um, and I got plenty of a fever, and they took a blood test and they found out I, I had rubella, then they found out I was pregnant at the same time. So that was another worry. Then we came down to uh, Rockhampton. And while we were while we were at Rockhampton, I would have been about four and a half months pregnant at this time. We came to Rockhampton and Neville returned to Tully because he had bought a, a little um well, it wasn't a little one, it was a, a rescue boat. So he went up there to bring it down. And he'd only been gone for about an hour and I started believing. And I and I don't know if any of you know Rock Rockhampton at all, but I walked from the north side all the way over the Fitzroy bridge and all the way up to the hospital, oh, pushing, so pushing, um, <clears throat> yeah, with, 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 with one, yeah, with, with 
one in the stroller and oh, I'm pregnant too, pushing the stroller and taking the other two with me. And we got up to the hospital and he said, oh, he said, I want you to go into hospital straight away. I said, I can't go into hospital straight away. I've got no, no one to look after the children. We've only just arrived here. I don't know anyone. He said, well, I'll give you three hours to get into hospital. So I went outside and I, the only people I could think of was to ring the police. I rang the police and they said, well, they knew of the Salvation Army, so I put them in the Salvation Army. So I went around to the stage to the Salvation Army place, and they, which was just luckily around the corner. And they said, well, we'll have to check up on you to make sure that you're rigid and you're not trying to dump children. So they checked me out and they took the children. They said, we, didn't, we don't know what to do with the baby, but we will manage. So I left the children there, and then I, I got clothes for them, of course, went all the way back again. <laughs> got clothes for them, and dropped them off, and then I went to the hospital. And uh, when I got to the hospital, I was, I'd been so hot, I thought I'd have a shower. And I got the trouble of having a shower because you're supposed to be on bed rest. Yeah. And I thought, after Rob be through today, <laughs> this is nothing. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, it all worked out. My husband came back, and I left. It, I left a uh, message for him in the, at the Caribbean Park at the Manchester place. And he came. He came up and saw me after a day or two. When he got back. He said the caravan was an absolute mess because I had clothes everywhere and I hadn't washed up that morning and uh, it was still there. Uh, then we went to Caloundra. Then we came to Gladstone. He, he, while we were at Caloundra, he came up to Gladstone and got a job at Caloundra. No, he had a job at Caloundra and that finished and then we came to Gladstone and told them that we lived there and they wanted him to start. And not, not, not the next day, but that next following night. So we rushed back down to Kalan. Quick, we've got a pack. <laughs> and I was eight and a half months pregnant by this stage. So we threw everything in the caravan and off we went to Glaston and he started work. And we were only there for a couple for about three weeks and then our daughter was born. So that was lovely. And our little daughter. <coughs> but she was all okay because we were really worried about her after we gone. Mm -hmm. But anyway, everything turned out okay. And, what, and then we then um, I started thinking about the boys because while we were at the caravan park, there were other children pinching their toys. They'd come into the annex and just automatically just think it was their thing, you know, and walk off with their toys. And then our kids would go looking. In their, in their annex looking for their toys, and I thought, this is awful, our kids will be stealing next, you know, so, I thought, you know, I really ought to teach them the commandments, because I learnt the commandments at school, <laughs> and I could only remember three commandments, and that was, thou shalt not commit adultery, which was no good for the kids, thou shalt not kill, that was no good for the kids, <laughs> and thou shalt not steal, I couldn't remember any of the others. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so I told my husband, I said, look, I'm really worried, I don't want the boys to, to become like that. So we looked for a house, we found a house. And while we were there, um, we'd only just moved in, this woman come down from across the well, street away, and she said she was having a Tupperware party, would I like to come that way? I could meet a lot of the locals. So I went to this Tupperware party and then she said everybody will have to leave by half past two because she had to go and to Father Smith's presbytery and clean it all out for him because that was her job every week. And I said, are you a Catholic? And she said, yes. And I said, do you know the commandments? <laughs> and she said, no. She said, I can't think of them. She said, I'll ask Father Smith. So she went off and she was next. And I waited and waited and waited and she didn't. And I called her up. I went around to see her and she said, no. And she said, Again, she said, I mean, this is about three weeks later. She said, I keep thinking about it, but she said, when I get there, I forget. And she was like, I'm new. <laughs> and then new people moved in behind us, and, and their little girls turned out were going to the Catholic school. Because I saw them <coughs> one day, and I said, 
excuse me, are you a Catholic? And she said, yes. I said, do you know the commandments? And she said, no. She said, I can't remember them. She said, but I'll get the girls, I'll get the girls to write them out when they come home. I said, I'll wait it and wait it and wait it. Nothing happened there either. And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, do you know Ray Kemp? Well, there was a, um, a little thing when you do our letterbox. Oh no, no, before that, just before that happened, um, I read this story, I, I used to smoke, I was smoking, and I wanted to give up smoking. Anyway, I read this, this story in a woman's magazine about this woman who gave up smoking for her children, and she gave it up because she didn't want her children to remember her if she should die from a, a, a smoking-related illness. To remember her with a filthy, smelly mouth. <laughs> I thought, well, I don't want my children to remember me like that either, you know. And I just felt like a dirty ashtray. I really did feel awful about it. Anyway, um, they had, they, I saw an advertisement about it, five-day plan. So I went to the five-day plan and took all the kids with me. <laughs> because my husband was on this afternoon shift. So I went, went to this, this and gave up my cigarettes. And uh, it would have been about two or three weeks after I gave up, some, after that course finished and I'd given them up, I thought, I wonder how strong I am. I wonder if I can resist cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so out comes a cigarette and I'm riding and I'm driving down the street and I'm heading to the steering wheel and I've had a cigarette in my mouth and I've got the matches here. You need to try and light them while you're driving. I was trying to do that normal all of a sudden this boy says, no, sure, I'm not chill. <laughs> and anyway, I thought, I must be mad. He thinks I'm trying to fight it again. And this boy said, no, sure, I'm not chill. And I thought, oh, and I flipped over and I thought, maybe it's my mother. Maybe it's my mother trying to warn me of an impending accident about to happen. So I pulled over. And then I started to realise it wasn't my mother's voice that I heard. It was a sort of a mannish voice. And I thought, I think it's trying to tell me that I shouldn't be killing myself. And yes. I didn't have a cigarette after that. Oh, no, man. Wow. <laughs> and then uh, I had a little leaflet put in the mailbox, and it was Ray Kent, 10, 10 night seminar thing. So I went to that, and, and the First, the first night was quite tame, and the second night, I took all the four kids with me of those two. And um, we got to about the third night, we started talking about the history, about history and Constantine, and, and how the Sabbath had been changed. Oh, Sabbath, my husband was after this. And when, he when I found it was the papacy who had changed things, if the Pope had walked down the aisle, I think I would have got up there and knifed him. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I thought, oh. how dare he try and pull the wool over people's eyes and move so above God's eye. But I was really rapid. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I was at church the following Sabbath. And I, I had hippie clothes, so I had to go to the second hand store and I got a big red card and skirt. Earrings, makeup. <laughs> 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 and I went to church still chewing gum for the chewing gum. Oh, I'm giving up cigarettes. I'll sit up the back row right there and everybody's looking. <laughs> what year was that? Pardon? What year was that? That would have been about 77? 76. Yeah, 76. Wow. lectures you could you, you, you took the whole ten nights and if you stayed the whole time and they had a vegetarian dinner at the end of it, you would get this great big family bottle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember that. Remember that? Yes. That was the oh, maybe that's where it came from. Any, anyway anyway, being a Catholic I had never ever held a 
Bible bit. <coughs> now that I have my absolute break with the Pope, you know, I, <laughs> and they're always telling us what to do, I, I got this Bible, and that was the most beautiful thing. I sat down and cried. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I read it up to, up to Leviticus until I got the unclean food, <laughs> and I became vegetarian. <laughs> anyway, the, the um, pastor at that time, he came around, Pastor Olson, did you know Graham Olson? He came around, oh no, he didn't tell me young men. He told, he told me when he delivered the big fires, the fireside edition that they had Bible studies on Wednesday nights. And if I like, I could go there. So I said, okay then. I said, I might come. Well, my husband was at work again. So off I went to the to a prayer meeting, Bible study, and I walked in with this great big Bible. <laughs> and everybody said, because I had never touched a Bible before, and this is my precious Bible. So I walked in, and they're all looking and smiling. Anyway, I sat down there and they were all looking and, and we, we did the night through, you know, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and then he, the pastor, Pastor Olsen, came around probably two days later and he brought you know, sort of little black ones, little black bottles around. And he said, this might be easier for you to carry in this <laughs> <laughs> And he said, I can give you Bible studies at home, you know. And I thought, well, that would be convenient. Stay me dragging the kids everywhere. So I said, oh, okay, then we'll have Bible studies at home. Well, when he came around for the third Bible study, I said, can I get back to my best And he said, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, you can't quite get that baptised, you know. So he kept me off for about another three weeks and I got baptised after that. And there was another fellow, he said, who was going to get baptised at the same time, but he chickened out. And I was very bold, you know. And, and I came out of the water and when I found out he wasn't going to get baptised, I said, well, keep it here for you next week. <laughs> and he got, got baptised next week. <laughs> <laughs> and one night I was at a I was at a free meeting. This was a couple of years later. Oh no, hang on. No, before that, um, after the baptism, I got in contact with the woman down who worked on the station. That woman who worked in the station hands, and I tracked her down. She, she had moved to Armadale in New South Wales. And I found out where she lived, and I wrote her a letter and told her that I'd been baptised. Mm -hmm. And she was overjoyed, and she she wrote back and said, "Oh, she said I was just so happy to hear the news." She said, and she said I got in front of the whole because Armadale Church apparently must have been very big. I don't know. And she said she got up in front there and she read the letter out to everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was so happy. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened after that? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. I'd been reading a lot of Sister White stuff. I, when I first got baptised, I didn't know anything about Sister White. I didn't know anything about Sister White for about two years after I got to long. I would have been in church for two years before I stopped and had a look at her stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I, I started reading a lot of her stuff and I thought <coughs> I should be homeschooling. I should be teaching my children school because it says that they should go to a school near the church, you know, with, associated with the church. So I thought, oh well, so I thought the next best thing is to teach them. So and at that time there were 16 people in, in, the, well, in the whole of Australia doing a correspondence course, you know, with, with ACE. Yeah, so I was the 16th person to start on that. And my husband wasn't with me, and he said, oh, he said, you're going to cause me so much trouble. <laughs> So I took that up and the pastor was against it and he said, you're going to give us a bad name. He said, why don't you send them, why don't you send them to the Baptist school? He said, why don't you send them, send them to the Baptist school? And he said, um, that they can get an education there and we can correct them at home. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. 
uh, and he said, well, it'll give us a bad name. And he said, you won't, you won't be very well looked at. So I'd rather hide her up. So I started homeschooling, and it wasn't long. It would have been about, oh, within the next six months, there were four other families homeschooling as well. Mm. Broke the eyes. Broke the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and one night I was at prayer meeting, and at my case, at prayer meeting, prayer meeting went well. When I came out of prayer meeting, I was talking to one of the men outside, outside, you know how you do. And this big black cloud came over me, and I could not even see this man's face. This big black cloud came over me. And, and I said to the man, I could hear him, hear him talking, and I said, I've got to go home. I really have to go home. And I got in the car, and the, and the cloud lifted enough for me to drive home, but I didn't have far to go. It was like just going from here down to the main road, down to Reed Road. It was only that, was only that far from the church. I used to walk to church on Sabbath because my husband mm -hmm. used the car on Sabbath. So anyway, I got home, and the boys, by this stage, they were... 15 and 17, so the two big ones, <coughs> um, they weren't home from TAFE. And I thought, they should be home by now. And so I, I made myself a couple of mile up and I got my Bible out and read a few verses and that and then I knelt down and prayed and asked that they would be home soon. And then I had to, had, you know, I started reading a little bit more and then there was a knock on the door and I thought, oh. And, but Neville was home this time. And, he, and uh, the, this man who worked with Stephen said, um, oh, is Neville there? And I said, yes. And this was 10 o'clock at night by this time. And, he's, and he said, well, you better go and wake him up. So I went and woke Neville up and, and we went to the lounge room and he said, oh, he said, your mm -hmm. two boys have been in a big accident. Oh, wow. And we said, oh, and he told us all about it. He worked at the RACQ with Stephen for this one. Stephen used to do as well. So um, we went to the hospital with that him and he left. He said he said if it was his children he'd like to know as early as possible. So off we went to the hospital and uh, the youngest, well Warren had died and they had resuscitated him going. And um, and Stephen was bleeding at both ends and he was pretty well shocked. He was just all blue, his lips were blue. But anyway, he, he told us what happened, and then the police wanted to interview him. I don't think they should have interviewed him while he was in that condition, but they did. He wasn't driving, and the, all the driver got was a, a broken sheet. That's all he got. And his brother, who was sitting in the back seat with uh, Stephen, must have been hanging onto the seat when, when he saw the accident about to happen. <coughs> and when he went backwards, you know, with the force of the thing, he tore all the nerves out of the back of his spine between his arm and that. But nobody picked it up at the hospital. And it wasn't until a month later that his arm started to go all funny. And now it's just a, it's just a, just hangs, you know, just uses it, flops it around him. But anyway, um, and Stephen said he remembers saying, uh, asking the driver, are you okay? And he said yes, and he asked, his, asked the other, the, the his brother, are you okay? And he said yes. And he knew he was okay and he asked Ryan if he was okay and there was no answer. And then he heard someone say, oh, this one's dead. Wow. So that, that put him in a terrible position. So he's very protective of, he was very protective of, of his brother. But anyway, they, they, the first ambulance went with, with the two least, least um, injured people and then um, the end was um, the second ambulance took the last two look took, took Warren who had died but they got him going again and the other fellow with his with his arm and um, took him they, they took them to a hospital but the second ambulance the battery wouldn't go the oh, no, no. battery it wouldn't go so the police just sat on the bottom of the car this is what the SES told us later on and the SES I went and got one of the batteries out of their truck and put it in the ambulance wouldn't go to the hospital so that's what happened there. And we saw them up at the hospital and Byron was just laid on a slab with a sheet over him. And he had this little tear in his eye. And and Stephen was down in an emergency. So we went down to emergency 
and so it was with Warren, but when, uh, with Stephen, but when he was interviewed, I said to Neville, oh, I'll pop you, I'm going to go and pray somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I went to the ladies and I couldn't bear to <laughs> be able to talk with you. So I, I went over to the uh, hand basin and I, and I just kneeled in him up to the basin. He was there. I mean, I don't know how long I was there praying. And then a nurse came in. She said, are you okay? And I said, yes. I said, I'm only praying. And she said, oh, she said, your husband's been so worried about you because you, you left a while ago and you haven't come back. And I said, well, tell him I'll be out anyway. So she went back out. And then I went on out after that. And then we went up out to see Warren. He was in intensive care because when they had him. Mm -hmm. but he, he was real waxy looking. And, you know, they, you know, was like. So, um. Uh, we were advised to go home for a couple of hours sleep anyway, and if there was any change in either of them, they would let us know. So I said, okay then. So we went home, and I prayed, and I, and I asked the Lord that if, well, we knew that they, they said that Stephen would probably be okay, but they weren't sure about Warren. So I, so I uh, asked the Lord, and I said to him, if Warren should survive, I said, I, I want to know if Warren's going to survive. And um, uh, if he is flown, and, and, and the message was that if he was flown to Brisbane, it would be a sign that the Lord was saying he's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And I believe that. So anyway, the next morning we went up to the hospital and I was going to ask the, the doctor, has anyone been? <laughs> you take your sending to Brisbane. I thought, I can't do that. If I do that, I'm denying my Lord the faith that he needs for me to have faith. Yeah. So I didn't ask, oh, that was so hard, you know, I just want to know, he's going to send you to prison. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, nothing was doing there and no, nothing happened at all. And I thought, oh, no, he must be going to have to die and I'll have to accept that. Yeah. So, uh, then Neville said, oh, we better go upstairs and see Stephen because it would have been breakfast time at the, at the hospital by then. But we, so we, started to go upstairs and, and we just got up the corridor up near the lifts and the stairs and I heard a phone ring and then the doctor put his head out and he said, could you come back here? So we come back here again <laughs> to, the, to the intensive care and he said, there's a, there's a, um, a plane at Rockhampton uh -oh. and it's, it's going down to Brisbane to pick up a patient if they come up and they wanted to know if there's anyone going down to Brisbane, would you like your son to go? And I said, before Neville could even can yes, even think, <laughs> yes, send him. <laughs> yes, please send him. Yes. <laughs> so, so they sent him down, and um, so we went well, we went up to see Stephen after that and told him that, that Warren was going down, but he wouldn't believe that he was on because the last thing he remembered was that he was dead. Mm. And he thought we were just saying that to yeah, cheer him up. Cheer him up. Mm. Mm. So we, we said, well, we're going to Brisbane for a day or two anyway. Mm. So, we, so that day was spent running around, um, getting flights ready and packing clothes and all that sort of stuff. And then we went down the following day. But before we left, <coughs> like that, that night before we left, it was a phone call. And Neville busied in busy himself by being up the backyard building a pigeon coop of all things. <laughs> he's, he's one of these men who buries his head in the sand every now and then. I don't want to think about it, I'll go and do this instead. So he did that. So, and I just sort of took over. And when they rang, when, when the hospital rang, the doctor was on the line, he said, he, he, you know, he said um, he's got a large mass of blood. And he said, we need permission if you want, if you want us to, to operate on him. I said, go ahead. I didn't even ask him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, go ahead and do it. And I said, we'll be down tomorrow morning to see. So that's what happened. And Neville came in probably about 10 minutes later and I told him, and I said, Warren's been operated on and I told him to go ahead and I give him the permission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we went down the next day and, um, and Warren had already been operated on there. And they had him on the life support system still. But they took him off to see if he could breathe by, him, by himself and if he could breathe by himself. Mm -hmm. So they gradually weaned him off the life support system until he could breathe by himself.
but he was in a coma for about four weeks. And then they uh, shifted him over to Princess Alexander Hospital in Brisbane for rehabilitation after that. So I stayed down there all that time. I stayed at Kalanga. Down there visiting him every day for breakfast, dinner, and tea. Then I went back home again. And I was really, really grateful that the kids were on their home schooling because they could come to the hospital and do their school work there. It all worked out well. And then after they finished their school work, they'd go around and, and help a lot of the, the other people with head injuries and play games with them so they could help, so they could get to know, get their skills back again, you know. Yeah. So we stayed in there for a long time, many, many, many months. And then we came back home for that. Um, that, that? Stephen come down to visit Warren? Yes. Oh, that was, that was good. Warren, yes. Neville brought, brought um, Stephen down when he came out of hospital. And, and, I'd, and I'd made arrangements for some of these other women with, on the, with their homeschooling to take the, uh, the other two younger ones, Daniel and Catherine. So they were, they were up there as well then. But anyway, um, Stephen came down and he just burst out howling when he saw him. Because he realised that we hadn't been lying after all, yeah. that he was alive. Yeah. Uh, and then Warren, when Warren came out of his coma, Neville dashed out the door because Kathy said to Warren, do you know, do you know who's talking to you? Because you know? she'd come down as well. And Neville dashed out and he went off and I thought he'd probably come to the loo or something. I didn't take much notice at all. But he was gone for a long time. And we were talking to Warren and seeing, seeing how much he remembered and that. And, and then I went outside and here's Neville out in the corridor floor and his eyes out. And I said, what are you pulling your eyes out for? He said, he knows. And he said, I didn't think he would. And, but the Lord had blanked all my alphabets. It had never occurred to me that he wouldn't know it. Because it was, I believe the sign in the first place and that was it. <laughs> so that was really wonderful. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Warren came home, and Warren came home, well, they sent him home about Christmas time, and the, the accident happened in the beginning of August. But while I was down at the hospital, I, they had, they had uh, the church, the church item on the television, do you remember that? They had on a Sunday, they had a Sunday church sitting on there. And this chaplain at the hospital came up to me because she knew I was a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, oh, she said, I like what your church put on the, on the television. And I thought to myself, that's strange. She shouldn't like what we put on the television. <laughs> anyway, I thought very seriously then I'm leaving, leaving the church. And I did. And I was right, and I thought, well, the only way to let them know is to write a letter to everybody to let them know why I'm leaving. And I was only intending to write about two pages, but it ended up being about twelve. So. And I sent it out to all the people I knew first, all the pastors got theirs about a week later, so that the pastors wouldn't be up the front and say, "Oh, Val said this and Val said that," just to put everybody off. I thought the people need to know first. And that's what I did. So I told them I wanted my name taken off the roll. It's by the church clerk and not by the pastor. And if it wasn't for coming, I said I was going to put it in the newspaper. But I had not the church. So they sent it to me. They sent me a letter. So I still got that. So what was the issues? Uh, they were just sort of doing the wrong things. And there was a hotel uptown. They used to take all the... Somebody had left a nursery and they used to leave at the hotels, they used to hire them out to the hotels to make the hotels more attractive for people to go into and that, you know. And the kingship club started on you know, the homosexuals and there was a couple of other things as well. <coughs> so that's why I left. That was before some of the biggest stuff started. Um, now it wasn't long after that I got I got cancer then. I, I went because my toenails and fingernails were both all blue and I went and, and I had all this I had a big had a big 
polters right around me all the time. Mm -hmm. And my husband said to me, and you know, in the plastic bin and everything, we go to bed and my husband said, do you know what you're treating yourself for? And I said, no, but it's going to get better. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you really should go to the doctor and get a diagnosis, notice this first, and then you can find out what you can treat yourself for. So mm -hmm. I went to the doctor and, and the ultrasounds had just come out then. So I had an ultrasound and they found this great thing. And it was resting right on, right, up there, right here in the hip, you know, where, where the main artery goes down to the leg. And that's, and that's why my blood supply and my fingernails were mm -hmm. So after the operation, um, I burst out crying because I had pink fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I was mad. <laughs> and then after I got out of hospital, I started on, on raw food because they said that I was going to cook sent me down for chemo, for four days chemo, mm -hmm. so I got on to more food, and that was really good. Because when I went down there for the chemo, they sent me home again after a blood, after a blood test, because I said, there's nothing wrong with your blood, go home. <laughs> well, <laughs> so that was really good. Mm -hmm. and, and Stephen one day decided he'd take my because it took a long time for the recovery, he was still on two, two crutches and trying to get around. When he first came home, we had to, he couldn't blink, and we had to put props in his eyes every half hour for his eyes to blink. And we had to teach him to swallow and, and all sorts of things, you know, he was pretty awful. They sent him home, I, I, I can never forgive the hospitals for this, but they were going to send him home on the plane, which would have been good, but at the last minute they rang. No, I rang them to see what flight he'd be on, and they said, we've sent him home in the bus. Oh. And they had sent him home in the bus. This was after about six months in hospital. Oh. And in his condition, and he only had about two oh. minute concentrations. And he came home in the bus, and he couldn't get up to go to the loo. He so oh. had no money to buy a drink. Some lady bought him a drink. He had no food. Oh. And he wasn't with the outside world or anything. All the way to Glasgow, it was a big 10 hour drive. Mm -hmm. So I was very upset with the hospital and I told her so too. Um, anyway, when he was starting to get a much better, you know, he started to improve, Stephen said, oh, Mum, I'll take Ryan out for a little drive and we might go fishing. And I said, oh, okay then. So off they went in my car, which didn't have reverse gear. <laughs> And because Ryan well, couldn't walk very well, Stephen drove down the ramp, at, like the boat ramp, and then when he could let, to let Ryan out so he wouldn't have to walk down there, he let him out and then realised he, he couldn't reverse to get out. So he had to drive down and he got stuck in the mud down the bottom of the ramp and the tide started coming in. <laughs> we found this out later because we didn't know where the car was. <laughs> And um, they both came home and somebody gave me a lift home in the car. And, and Warren was giggling, he hadn't giggled and smiled for years and years. <laughs> and and um, <laughs> oh, that's right. And every time Stephen kept looking at the clock and then he said, I have to go and then Warren would burst out a little giggle hard again, very much like that. Mm -hmm. And then I think we um, so Warren stayed home, but Stephen would disappear for a couple of hours and then he'd come back again and this went on all night, you know, during the night as well. And, and Neville said to Stephen next morning, he said, that car better come home because he asked Stephen, what's wrong with the car? And Warren and Stephen said, oh, it's got a... A wet battery. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, so Stephen got the car, the car home the next day, the day before never got home from work. But it was a mess. He had got, you know, it's pretty full gallon drums, put rope around them, and doors that had all the windows open, the car so he could put one on each, two on each side of the car so it would float. And when the tide went out and he had it, to some 
mangroves or something, and he'd be on the top rowing as well, so it wouldn't go out with the tide. <laughs> <laughs> Even the police were sitting there laughing. <laughs> we didn't find this out until I got back home. <laughs> Anyway, the car, of course, didn't go for a while and we ended up having to get another car. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't in a good mood. <laughs> but he tried, he, he said he just wanted to give me a bit of a break, you know, because everybody else used to just disappear. Because if Warren said something, it would be repeated out a thousand times just a day. And just went on and on. And he eventually left. Um, <clears throat> he left home when he was 32, and even by then he only had a concentration stand of about half an hour. He drove all the way to Darwin, stopping every 25 minutes, for a quarter of an hour, and then driving again for 25 minutes, all the way to Darwin. Oh, wow, that's a long trip. That's a long trip. At the time of that Balconian murder, and of course, he had bought a mobile phone and we thought oh we'll be right he's going to keep in contact with us but as soon as he goes out west a little bit there's no no yeah, so we can hear a thing and we hear all the bit this old pony i think oh, i'm kidding oh, no. <laughs> we just might our love to have him there um yes now while while i was writing my letter to the church stephen came in one night and he said oh, mum about one o'clock in the morning it was, he said, Mum, can I borrow the car? And I said, what do you want to borrow our car for? And he said, mine's stuck in the mud. <laughs> and I said, oh, yes. And he said, we need to get out of the water. And I said, okay, then. So we went around and here, um, that was in the water and right had fallen. He had driven along a dirt road and because it was pouring rain, and he slid sideways and into the, and there's a canal in Glaston. He had fallen in there and the water was up to the headlights. All through the car. Anyway, I couldn't do anything. I rang up the RACQ and they said it would cost a hundred dollars just for the call out, let alone any work or anything to do with it. So I said, well, We can't afford that. And I said, Steve, well I'm going home back to bed, so I went home. And he came home too. And I prayed and I said, Lord, I said, I've got lots to do for tomorrow, I thought I've got the children's homeschooling to do, and I said I've got to finish this letter to the church, and I said it's raining, and so I don't know how we're going to get this car out, and, and I said please help us, and may it stop raining, so the next morning I went to bed, I got up, got my husband off to work, and while the ch two children and I were having um, a little prayer session, Stephen put all this stuff in the car, like shovels and chains and everything. And uh, mm -hmm. did not the most marvelous thing happen. Mm -hmm. We got to the car, it was still pouring rain, and I thought, how are we ever going to get this out? So we went up to a little higher park to get off the road so other people could still use the road. And this ute pulled up near the car. And I thought, said to Stephen, look, they think someone's stolen this car and they pushed it into the creek. And I said, I better run down there and tell him it's not stolen and what's happened. So I went down there and um, <laughs> I said to the man, I said, it's not, it's not a stolen car. I said, we're just sitting up here wondering how we're ever going to get that out. And he said, no, no worries, lady. He said, I've got a gang of workmen just around the corner. He said, we start work at seven. We left home at half past six. Said, and by this time it was about 20 to seven. And he said, I've got a gang of um, men around the corner there who start work at seven. And he said, I'll be back in five. And he was back in five. And he had about eight men come out. And then there was a, a sort of a little little truck with a, with a crane on it. And they just got the car out. Climbed it on the ground. They said to Stephen, have you got the keys? And he said, yes. He said, get in and see if it starts. And it started. And he went home. And we were home before seven o'clock. <laughs> Half an hour that happened, oh, but just absolutely horrible. Am I over time? It's a point of five. <laughs> because there's other things to go with. Thank you for sharing. I'll have to do them as a, something else next time. Do you think that would be better?
Well, why, why don't you just, um, there's a few highlights, isn't there? Hey. There's a few highlights that are quite dramatic. I know, we haven't got to them yet, but... That's nothing. But we, hot, we, hot, we end up hiring a school teacher out to school for wine to get all his packages back. And he became a future in turn. And he wasn't going to stay in a wheelchair. And well, I, mean, I can't tell you that bit yet because we need that bit. <laughs> so if you like, if you want to finish up now, everybody's sitting here patiently. <laughs> Because the next thing is a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit too, yeah, things that happen. Doing two parts. Yeah, do it part two parts. Yeah, like, like blends. Yeah, do it with blends. Mine was six. Getting <laughs> <laughs> late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. I had forgotten how much there was in her story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, all of it is so interesting. Incredible. No wonder we missed it. We almost missed it after Rainbow Bay. I know, she did. <laughs> okay. Well, um, shall we close with prayer? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Yeah, our Father in Heaven, we thank you so much for the testimonies that we've heard from many people this camp, and we thank you for Val's testimony. We haven't obviously heard all of it yet, but what we have heard just proves how you've led her, how you've protected her, and, and how interesting you can make life sometimes <laughs> in the journey that you put people through. And we just pray that you would bless her and her family. Um, I think I understand that her husband is still not really a believer and I just pray that you would please continue to bless her influence with her, her extended family and that you would continue to protect her and care for her. And please be with us the rest of this afternoon until we meet again tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.